Good evening friends, we're now on part three of the man who knew how to forgive, Saint Jose Maria Escriva, a priest who was in great difficulties during the Spanish Civil War because they were targeting and killing religious. The refugees he took refuge for a short time in the homes of generous friends who were terrified by the presence of a priest. Then two young doctor's friends and followers of Escriva convinced Dr. Angel Suez, his former schoolmate, to accept him as a patient in his psychiatric clinic located on the outskirts of Madrid. On the 7th of October, a service vehicle from the emergency hospital, driven by militiamen, went to pick up a non-dangerous madman. While bringing him to the sanatorium, the driver remarked, If he's that crazy, we might as well just shoot him and not waste our time. He stayed at that clinic until mid-March, 1937, where he posed as a madman. He had to avoid the nurses who belonged to extremist trade unions and were soon suspicious of him. He knew that most of the patients were Catholics and would want to go to confession and receive Holy Communion. So despite all the dangers, he made Dr. Sulis promise that he would not allow any of the patients in danger of death to die without receiving the last sacrament. One incident of forgiveness connected with this period is the following. When Jose Maria decided to leave the sanatorium to take refuge in another shelter, the doctor signed him off on his leaving with a false diagnosis to justify his internment. The document said, I certify that Jose Maria Escriva, Sik Alvas, 35 years of age, has been treated by me since the age of 29 for an endogenous psychosis which affects him periodically. He is discharged as of this day, having recovered from the latest outbreak of this illness, which required him to be interned in this sanatorium for several months, given the difficulties of treating him at home under the present circumstances. From today, we are allowing him to live with his sister. After the war in the city of Vittoria, he met a well-known priest who had been rector of the seminary of Madrid and who before the war had public described, publicly described Jose Maria as being a crazy visionary. With a smiling face, he approached this priest and showed him the certificate from Dr. Sewells as if to say jokingly, you were right. He did not rub it in, but rather chose to play down the old misunderstanding by reducing the whole affair to the level of a joke. That colleague of his, a good and zealous priest, was so impressed that from then on he showed Jose Maria a constant and sincere affection. Once again, we see the deep roots from which his ability to forgive flowed. Alvaro del Portillo recounts a post-war incident. At the beginning of the 40s, an aunt of mine and her husband invited our founder and me to a luncheon. Another guest was Manuel Aznar a very well-known intellectual who was considered 
to be the best Spanish journalist of his day and would later become the Spanish ambassador to the United States. At one point, this gentleman said to the father, I would love to write your biography. And the father responded, Well, for me one word is all that's needed. Sinner. But a sinner who loves Jesus Christ very much. In pardoning others so readily, he was always deeply aware of the pardon he was continuously receiving from God. That is why he often spoke about his own life as the vocation of a prodigal son. Living Space On 14th of March 1937, he left the clinic to take refuge in the Honduran Consulate at 51 Paiso de La Castellana, the main avenue in Madrid city centre. At the urging of some family friends, Consul Pedro Jaime de Mata Salaza welcomed him into that diplomatic refuge along with his brother Santiago and four members of Opus Dei. They camped out in the living room for lack of any other space. It was only in May that they were able to move into a small room which previously must have been a coal storage room. It was so narrow that the floor was completely covered when the mattresses they slept on were unrolled at night. The room had only one high narrow window overlooking the interior space. It was so dark during the day that they had to leave on the single bulb that hung from the ceiling. They remained in veritable exile in this diplomatic asylum for half a year until August 1937. Hunger was pressing along with constant uncertainty. uncertainty. Shortly before their arrival at the Honduran consulate, the consulate of Peru had been invaded by the armed forces and all the refugees hiding there were arrested. 300 Spaniards and 60 Peruvians. As the consul's daughter, Consuelo Elo, later said, people were afraid after my father told him it was dangerous to celebrate mass in the foyer. He always celebrated it in their room. The altar was an empty bottle box placed upside down. The chalice was a drinking glass given by the consul's wife. Food was scarce and people went hungry. In fact, when Donna Dolores, Josa Maria's mother, managed to visit him, she did not at first recognize him because he had become so thin. It was only when he spoke to her and said, Mama, that she recognized his voice and hugged him, overcome with emotion. Family life. With nerves at breaking point, it is quite understandable that the refugees in the consulate were inclined to complain all the time. They vented their anger about the war and its calamities, anxious about delays in their hopeful liberation. In addition, they quarrelled among themselves, but the little incipient family of Opus Dei managed to achieve an environment of work and serenity, of cordiality and hope, which the other refugees noticed and even tried to imitate. Jose Maria encouraged those with him to organize their day as if nothing were out of the ordinary. He reminded them of the need to make good use 
of the treasure of time and to avoid useless daydreaming that gave free rein to the imagination. Hence they drew up a study schedule including studying languages with a view to the future expansion of Opus Dei throughout the world. There was also time set aside for material jobs and for growing in their spiritual life. Time for prayer, mass, rosary, reading of the New Testament or of some spiritual book. The father preached a meditation to them almost every day, usually on the gospel. They also tried when possible to speak with other refugees, encouraging them and endeavouring to bring them closer to God. The consul's son-in-law, José Luis Rodríguez Candela, would afterwards remark that he never saw in José Maria any sign of anxiety or depression. He was a person who made living together easy and pleasant. He never created problems of any kind or made any comment that was less than positive. Not about the red government, not about the white government, not about the bombings, not about any of the difficulties. One of the young fellows with him Eduardo Alice Drew noted down, sometimes we thought if only this could last forever. Had we ever known anything better than the light and warmth of that little room? As absurd as it was in those circumstances, that was our reaction and from our way of seeing things, it made perfect sense. It brought us peace and happiness day after day. All the refugees, just like Jose Maria, were fleeing from an unjust persecution that endangered their lives and family, their material possessions and livelihood. They had more than enough reasons to resent their persecutors. Yet in spite of everything around Father, this never happened. With his great faith, he managed to infuse in those alongside him a deep spirit of understanding and forgiveness for everyone. A noticeable absence. Reflecting on these events, Escriva's biographer Vasquez de Prada notes that what normally attracts our attention is some odd gesture, some unusual fact or word, but that are sometimes there are things that are noticed precisely because of their absence, because they are not observed. He brings this up in the context of the numerous letters that Jose Maria wrote during this enforced enclosure addressed to his spiritual children who were not in the consulate and also to his own family. He would write them in code, sending them to the addresses by means of couriers or various subterfuges. In that way, he kept up with all these contacts and helped by letter those he could not help directly by speaking with them. His biographer notes that something is missing that one could reasonably expect to find in these letters. There are no references to nor, com nor commentaries on political affairs. There is not a word about government's zone battlefronts, cities liberated or occupied, allies or enemies, 
victims or guilty parties. These silences are not because of censorship, but for reasons of a spiritual nature, as indeed can be noticed in the remarks made by those who shared his consulate asylum. This approach meant that his sons did not develop any bellicose attitudes. In his presence, no one mentioned any military operations. One simply forgave and forgot. But Vaquez de Prada also admits that when necessary, the founder did touch on the subject of the war and always referred to it as a catastrophe. But his priestly spirit was open to souls in both zones and all factions. His general intercession at Mass took in the whole ocean of human suffering and produced by the conflict all the suffering at the battlefronts in prisons, hospitals, homes, places of refuge. Father Jose Maria's attitude was not one of lofty indifference, but rather of consummate charity stemming from a higher supernatural vision of the world events. He was always very concerned with what was happening, says the consul's son-in-law. Though at the same time he was very much above it, he never spoke with hatred or rancour or judged anyone. On the contrary, he was always saying, this is a barbarity, a tragedy. He was saddened by what was happening, but not in merely human way. When the rest of us celebrated victories, he remained silent. Here he was, practicing what he preached never thinking badly of anyone, not even if the words or conduct of the person in question give you good grounds for doing so. I don't want to put labels on anyone, he used to say. He knew that in each human being there is an abyss whose depths only God can fathom. A universe infinitely greater and richer than what a person's errors and deficiencies might lead one to suppose. Eduardo Alastru, who spent those months alongside Saint Jose Maria, had a very good memory and was quick at shorthand. Thanks to him, there have survived almost complete texts of more than 50 meditations that Saint Jose Maria preached during the six months spent in the Honduran consulate. As already mentioned, the father would gather his five companions, a number which later increased, to spend some time in prayer. To guide their prayer, he would address some reflections to them in a meditation composed partly of spiritual commentary and partly of direct dialogue with God. Escriba's spirit of forgiveness during wartime. The revolution, he said, on 24th of August, caught us by surprise, absorbed in our work solely concerned with the desire to serve God. If we remain faithful, 
Won't God prepare a few fruitful future for us and all the more so if the harvest has been fertilized by our sufferings thus believing and hoping in him loving him with all our strength we will be happy and filled with peace no matter what circumstances surround us we will not lack joy even in the midst of hunger and disdain and the loss of our freedom. I must confess that I've suffered horribly here, but I have to say as well that I've experienced deep joy in this confinement of ours. Let us make the specific resolution today not to become angry or upset about anything no matter what happens 30th of May how can we be harsh towards others when he isn't his justice blends with his mercy and produces a marvellous equilibrium a gift we should implore for ourselves 20th of July instead of quickly judging our neighbor and perhaps harshly condemning him we should consider what would have become of us if we had been placed in the environment of the person whom we've judged if we had read the books he read if we had felt the passions that overpowered him this consideration will help us show charity towards him isn't paul's example sufficient for us call to the apostolate at a late hour he won so many souls for god after being a persecutor of christians he became an example for everyone let's be understanding then who knows whether that person who perhaps we interiorly scorn and condemn if corrected and purified and converted into a healthy stalk might not produce more savory fruit than us 10th of august lord of mercy grant me the grace to be merciful towards others may i be unyielding with myself while showing understanding to those around me may i not judge others so as not to be judged myself 24th of august we've tried hard to get out of this place but so hard, far haven't managed to do so all of our attempts have come to naught one after another how should we react by not losing our peace we should continue to use all the available means and trustingly place our hope in God faced with this situation do we become angry or give in to impatience or ill humour? Why? Don't we deserve these setbacks in punishment for our sins and weakness? But you, Lord, don't punish anyone. You only know how to love the fugitive. Before that month of August came to an end, he would finally be able to leave. The solution, quite a poor one, could not be used for very long. It was a document signed by the consul, which accredited him as intendante or chief supply officer 
for that diplomatic legation. A paper falser than Judas. Saint Jose Maria said, this was the first of many steps that would eventually enable him to cross over the Catalonian and Andoran Pyrenees to the desired destination the zone where the practice of religion was respected and where priestly work could be carried out with the exception of those priests and lay people who had allied with the Reds and who were now in prison. From Burgos, capital city of that part of Spain, he would be able to give himself without impediments to the mission God had called him to. Murdered Friends The father reached Pamplona on 17th of December 1937. There his priestly life gradually returned to normal. He also began to receive sad news about priest friends who had been assassinated. Even before the war, Father Jose Maria Samona, the first priest who had joined Saint Jose Maria in Opus Dei, had been poisoned. Now he learned that one of his closest friends, Father Pedro, Povida, canonized by Blessed St. John Paul II, founder of the Theresian Association that was active in the field of education, had been shot. Father Lino V. Merguay, uh, who was arrested on 16th of August 1937, was murdered and his body dumped by the wall of Madrid's East Cemetery. Another priest who had been Escriva's baptismal godfather was also assassinated. Years later, in reply to a question from a woman who had suffered a very cruel persecution in her own country, he referred to some of these events his own baptismal godfather. Don Mariana, he recalled, was a widower who later became a priest. They martyred him when he was 63 years old. I am called Mariano on his account and the nun who taught me how to read and write at school and who was a friend of my mother's before becoming a nun was murdered in Valencia. All this doesn't horrify me, but it fills my heart with tears. For those people were mistaken. They didn't know how to love. I have recalled all this in order to console you, my daughter, not to speak about politics, because I know nothing about politics. I don't talk about it, nor will I ever do so, as long as God leaves me in this world, since that's not my job. But tell your family on my part to join you and me in forgiving during those years of the war and after the war, when so many wounds were infected with rancor, Jose Maria could only speak of forgiving. He well knew that resentment withers the heart. And on one of his trips from Burgos in April 1938, Father Jose Maria met a young officer on the train. 
In a letter to his sons in Burgos, written from Cordoba, he wrote, His second lieutenant, who had suffered tremendous harm to his family and his estate at the hands of the Reds, said that he would soon get vengeance. I told him that I too have suffered, but that I want the Reds to be converted. These Christian words had a strong effect on his noble soul, consumed with a desire for violence, and he became quite thoughtful. The Periscope and the Lark. In the middle of the war, on 7th of June 1938, Jose Maria had the opportunity to go up to the front lines outside Madrid, which were very static. One of the first members of Opus Dei, Ricardo Fernandez, an architect by profession, had been injured when a defective grenade exploded close to where he was working. Interned in a military hospital, he managed to send a telegram to the father informing him of his accident. As soon as he could, the priest went to see the injured man and spent the night in the command post of an artillery battery in Carabanchel Alto. The next day, looking through the unit's periscope, he could see the house at 16 Ferraz Street, the centre of Opus Dei in Madrid, newly acquired in 1936. It was almost completely destroyed. On seeing it in ruins, he burst out laughing. An officer asked him why he had laughed. Because I'm looking at what little remains of my own house. Saint Jose Maria began to laugh. Because of his trust in God and his hope for the future, it did not occur to him to speak badly of any enemies. He harboured no bitter thorns in his heart. A story of resentment. Towards the end of June 1938, with the war still raging, Pedro Casquiaro was walking along the street in Burgos. Unexpectedly, he came across a woman who on seeing him reacted with hostility. She looked at him in anger, as though seeing the very devil himself. Pedro recognised her to be the wife of a civil servant in the treasury, one Giorgi Bermudez, who before the war had been living in the same city as himself. Albacete in a house quite near Pedro's own family home. Bermudez had the reputation of being extremely right-wing. Perplexed, Pedro racked his memory for some reason to explain such a reaction on her part, but could not find one. When he arrived at the Sabadell Hotel, where the father was living, the latter informed him that he had just received word that Pedro had been denounced as an enemy of the regime by Bermudas, such an accusation could bring very serious consequences. He had accused Pedro of being a communist, the son of a leftist to whom crimes had been falsely attributed and that he, Pedro, was a spy in General Orgaz's headquarters. All this was reason enough for the firing squad 
or lengthy imprisonment. The father advised him to visit this man's wife in order to try to clear up the misunderstanding and ask her to persuade her husband to withdraw the accusation. This visit, Pedro writes, was counterproductive. Among other things, she said it was unjust that while her son was risking his life at the front, I was peacefully in the rear guard spying for the Reds. She refused to budge. Jose Maria decided to take the initiative. and presented himself in the office of the treasury where Mr. Bermudez worked. The interview was very tense. Mr. Bermudez was cold and insolent. The father defended Pedro with paternal affection, putting himself forward as a trustworthy witness since he had known Pedro for several years remaining completely calm he tried to make Bermudez understand the injustice he was about to commit but neither the earnest requests of the father full of charity nor his strong words about justice succeeded in softening the heart of this poor man who obstinately repeated that if they could not lay hands on the father of Pedro, then the son would have to pay the price for him. Both the father and the son have to pay for this. Jose Maria left the office saddened and only broke his silence to say as though moved by some inexplicable inspiration. Tomorrow or the day after a funeral. Only a few hours afterwards, they heard that Bermudas had died suddenly in his office. Pedro himself remarked, The sad news had a great impact on me. I fell ill and had to lie down in bed. Meanwhile, the father helped me to regain my composure and quietly told me to be at peace regarding that man because he was morally sure that God would have mercy on his soul and had given him the grace of final repentance. He added that since leaving his office, he had not ceased praying both for him and for his children. From that day forward, all my life I have prayed for his soul and for his family. I am sure he enjoys the glory of God thanks to divine mercy and the Father's prayers. God will have rewarded him for all his good works and will no doubt have forgiven him for those moments of darkness so understandable amid the chaos of war. We can begin to understand Jose Maria's excrever's readiness to forgive when we read these words of his written in, that he's written in his intimate notes on 30th of December 1933 if you have so many defects why are you surprised to find defects in others a person who sees himself as a sinner and in need of forgiveness has his heart open to being understanding towards other people's weaknesses Personal humility is the fertile soil for understanding. Saint Jose Maria was never 
scandalised by anyone. All right, that person has behaved badly towards you, but haven't you behaved worse towards God? For if God, despite my great personal wretchedness, treats me with confidence, I should therefore do the same with all souls, as Christ himself taught. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. Matthew 6 verse 14 Forgiveness in less dramatic situations, patience. The setting for these events is the Sabadell Hotel. The protagonists are Pedro Castiaro and Paco Francisco Botello, Botella, both of whom studied mathematics at the university. They had accompanied the father on the journey across the Pyrenees and were those who spent most of the time with him along with Jose Maria Albareda in that small hotel in Burgos. Well, listeners, watchers, friends, family, godchildren, I think we'll call that an end for now and uh, we'll start next time with a cassock gets badly torn. So thank you for listening. God bless you all. Have a good evening. Don't forget to pray. And please pray for me. I will pray for you. We all need prayer and we all need forgiveness and we all need to give forgiveness and to be forgiven for all of our wrongs and sins. And Yes, we need to go to confession at least once a month. Thank you. God bless. Good night.